I'm begging you. All right. Come on. You okay, partner? No. No, I am not. I'm a mess. Well, you ain't dead. There is that. Jimmy Brooks. I think it's best for both of us if we pretend this never happened. Well, I agree. You saved my life. You're a good man, and I, uh, here. You want a pen? It's one of them steel ones. Oh. That's very kind of you. <laughs> but I'm not a good man, Jimmy Brooks. Not usually. You see, I was in Blackwater. I killed people. And maybe I should have killed you. Should I have killed you, Jimmy Brooks? Me? I never saw you. Not, not now, not, not never. I think we have an understanding? Of course we do. Jimmy Brooks. <laughs> I will remember that. I've got a good memory. I haven't. Hey guys, I'd like to uh, help me welcome Roger Clark in here. He's right here. Let's get him right on stage. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We just saw that clip there. Do you, have you uh, seen your work a few times over? Well, I'm on my second playthrough now. <laughs> uh, and they're still, still seeing new things. Yeah. They, they put a lot of, we all did, put a lot of work into it, a lot of detail. Yeah, um, I'm, I like it. It's pretty good. <laughs> Arthur doesn't look too bad, does he? No, not <laughs> at all, not at all. Do you know what they're going to put in there, you know, from the get-go? Or is it sort of uh, when you first started playing through, you're like, oh, okay, they used that scene, they didn't use that scene? Well, yeah, obviously, you, you, while you're doing it, you don't know what is and isn't going to be cut. But um, I remember when we started the process, you know, I had done performance capture before. Um, uh, so I was, it wasn't completely alien to me, but I remember the way that the animators helped inform our performances was really invaluable. They, we, we, over the years that we worked on it, I worked on that game for five years, um, and some other people were even longer, <laughs> the designers especially. But uh, as the time went by and we began to understand each other's job better, uh, we ha and we found a new appreciation for it too, and to the point where the animators greatly informed our performances as actors. Because you're in a mocap suit, you're in this tight spandex, and you've got a helmet with a camera, and a big light pointing at your face. So the animators were, um, they were able to show us the environment that we were actually going to be performing in, which really gave us a, a, an in, invaluable context, you know? We were able to know what time of day it was, you know, whether it was hot or cold, whether it was a swamp and you had to swat flies away from your face. The, uh, the world that they designed and that they were able to show us as we were doing the work really, really uh, changed the landscape for me, you know, because I had previously been mostly a theater and uh, voiceover actor. So to work in this brand new medium, which was literally exploding in front of our very eyes, and the technology was advancing in front of our very eyes, and, and with that advancement, you know, it gave our performances more and more freedoms, and we had less and less limitations. It was a truly remarkable thing to behold. And we're going to get into all of that, but I want to get a little bit into the beginning. You were a bit of a gamer. You played yeah. video games when you were growing up. You know, can you tell us that first memory and that first game maybe you were playing? Sure, sure. I got the Atari 600, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I had done Pong and stuff before then, but this was the first one that I got. I think I was five or six. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Do you have any vivid memories of that experience in one particular game? And did you ever think, you know, who made this? I would love to, to be a part of this process. I remember E.T. on the Atari, which... Widely regarded as the, the one worst... One of the worst yes, video absolutely. games ever made. I loved it. I was five. I, like, I didn't know that I had finished it. 
<laughs> you just had to find the phone one place and then pieces go of the phone. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and then you you find and then you call and then they come and that was it. Uh, but I was still fascinated by the, the fact that it was interactive, you know, and that there was a story that was interactive and that you could affect. That blew my mind, and obviously. Uh, being one of the, fir the uh, well, the generation that uh, the first generation that kind of grew up with gaming, and to see the way that the stories have unfolded and become more mature as the audiences have aged, that was really interesting too. And then we you know, we graduated on to the Nintendo, and then the Super yeah. Nintendo. I remember I was able to beat M Bison with one hand <laughs> at level That's seven. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I was Blanca because he was the best at least. <laughs> But it was slightly different in the arcade version. I remember Chun-Li and Ryu being pretty good, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Now let's get into the acting portion of your life. You know, how early did you start? Did you see it as a career or just a, a, a pursuit at that time? I had been doing Amdram as a child. You know, I remember the first thing I did was uh, I was the letter Z in kindergarten. So I, I, I closed the show. Any, and nomination, any nominations for that? Or? No, no nominations. <laughs> A lot of alliteration of the letter Z, or Z, as some of the BAFTA members would say. Uh, so I did a lot of amateur dramatics, and uh, I remember I was the newspaper boy for a musical, a Neil Simon musical called Working uh, at my parish. And then when I moved to Ireland when I was 13, 12 years old, and I started working with uh, the Calera Dramatic Society, and their big annual thing was the what you call a pantomime show, which is a Christmas-themed uh, for lack of a better word, musical, uh, which is very popular in Ireland and the UK. It's not so much over here, but you know, it's it's simple. It's simple kind of theater with you know Sinbad and the Sailor, Aladdin, etc., stuff like that. Um, so I did that, and but I never had the when it was time to start getting ready for college. I didn't have the bravery yet to to commit myself to it. I didn't think I'd be able to earn a living out of it. I was scared because. Uh, it's something that I loved dearly, but I just didn't think that it, was, it would make sense to do it as a profession. So I started doing an HND in computer studies in Wales. What, um, an HND is what I think you call it an associate's degree over here. And I'm like halfway through the second year and I realize I'm terrible at it. <laughs> so it was then that that really made me get the bravery to make the decision. So I transferred to do uh, a bachelor's in theater, and I did that at University of Glamorgan in Wales, and that's when I started my career. And that was 20 years ago. And what point did you start to feel, you know, like you were moving towards a career in acting? At what point was there a particular role? Are you still striving for that? I mean, obviously, with a BAFTA nomination, that's something towards that. So, I mean, tell me when you felt personally okay, this is a career and I, I feel like I'm getting success in this. There were a few landmarks that I remember. I remember the first time I worked with professionals. It was when I was still at drama school. We did a, a national tour of Wales with Juno and the Paycock uh, by Sean O'Casey. And that was the first time I was working with uh, professionals and that blew my mind and I learned a lot from them. And uh, I remember the time I got my equity card uh, and then SAG-AFTRA, a uh, very proud union member, uh, both of American equity, British equity, and SAG-AFTRA. And, um, and then, of course, when I started working on Red Dead, not long before that, I was able to actually make a living solely from acting. And I remember at that time being like, wow, I finally, I finally don't have to bartend anymore. I don't have to cater anymore. I don't have to, I don't have to tell drunks that, you know, really, I'm just, I, I also do acting. And they're like, yeah, sure you do. Give me another beer. <laughs> and when I, when I didn't have to do that anymore, I remember being amazed. And now, you know, my wife is here and we have two beautiful sons at home. I remember when, uh, when she was pregnant with our first child, I was terrified. <laughs> That's when I thought I was going to have to give it up, too, because I wasn't quite making a living solely from acting then. And, uh, and I thought that my, my priorities were going to change, which they did, of course, but they changed, and it changed my perspective of how I approached the profession, too. It made me more economic in my choices, and, and that was a good thing, because you know, often so many artists second-guess themselves and spend waste so much time doing that, whereas the joy is really just in the doing. So. I remember when that happened too. Um, 
my children being born is definitely a huge part of my career. And yeah, and you create an amazing character in Arthur Morgan. Tell me, you know, those early days in the theater, was there any moment or any mentor that informed the actor that you became? Do you have any sort of vivid memories of that back in the day? I had some great teachers uh, at Glamorgan. I remember Dr. Richard Hand, uh, who, who was one of my teachers, was an amazing role model. He introduced me to uh, uh, the Grand Quignol, which is, I hope I pronounced that right, if some of you might know it, it's a French theater, horror theater thing. It was kind of a precursor to the Twilight Zone, like 100 years before, it would typically be three one-act plays, uh, one horror, one comedy horror, and then another horror one. He introduced me to that and uh, made me fall more and more in love with live theater, uh, which is, I wouldn't be the actor I am today were it not for that solid, firm foundation of, of starting out from on, on treading the boards, you know. Um, Sam Boardman Jacobs was an excellent teacher too. Uh, my father uh, was quite an influence as well, you know. Both of my parents passed away when I was quite young, so um, I remember when I finally jumped off the, dive, the deep end and decided to become an actor. I, I really was anticipating my father to go, what are you, nuts? But he was actually 10 times, 100 times more supportive than I had anticipated, and that really meant the world to me and kind of gave me uh, the validation that I was hoping to, hoping to have as I approached this profession. And I was like, oh my God, am I actually going to do this now? But uh, his support really helped me a lot. So tell me about, you had this background in theater, you were doing short film work, if I'm correct, and then, you know, tell me about the first experience with motion capture and what that felt like, and was there any way to know what you were getting into before the actual experience? Yeah, uh, so my first bit doing mocap wasn't Red Dead. I worked on a game um, it was about a dozen years ago now, I think it was out of a studio in Kent in, in England, and uh, that was the first time I put on the Lycra, and the... <laughs> The technology. Is that what they call it when you guys are strapping up? Like, let's put on the like uh, yeah, game. That's what I say. Uh, the actor who plays Sadie Adler in Red Dead Redemption 2, wonderful woman, Alex McKenna, she calls them superhero scuba diving suits, <laughs> which I kind of like. I always like that analogy. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very unforgiving, unflattering uniform that you wear to work every day. It's the same thing, uh, which has several balls on it, which... Uh, a grid from suspended from the ceiling then translates those balls into an algorithm and then that in turn is you get something like what you saw up there so you can appreciate how how vital the animators and the engineers and, how, and the technicians are go into a performance as much as the just as much if not more so than the performers themselves so yeah I remember it was a game called Shell Shock 2 and the technology back then was nothing like it is now uh, like, not to get into, to bog you down with too much tech, no details, but every time you introduce something that is, you have to interact with in a scene, that itself has balls also, uh, because it needs to be plotted, and, you know, so when I worked on the first bit of mocap, it would take about half an hour for all of the sensors to pinpoint those balls and to be able to translate that into what they needed the footage to be. And then on my first day on, at Rockstar, they just, it was like a quick snap of the fingers. And I was like, wow, okay, this is how much the technology's changed now. Yeah. This medium is exciting, and now film are using it, you know, and we see Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk and the Avengers, and all the amazing work of people like Andy Serkis with the Planet of the Apes trilogy, and uh, his studio in Britain, the Imaginarium, I think it's called, and the work that they're kicking out, it's amazing. So to be a part of that at a relatively early stage was, I felt a real privilege. And to feel that advancement, and we were talking a little bit earlier about the actors now that are, you know, whether they're coming from film or TV, they're, you know, grandly impressed by the work that you have to do with motion capture. It's almost like a theater in the round. It's almost like your every yeah. movement is captured in a way that uh, a two-way camera stream isn't, you know? Absolutely, yeah. It's getting more and more like film, you know, in the sense that and gaming does incorporates motion capture in different ways than cinema does too. Like in gaming, typically, you're going to go for as wide a shot as possible when you're in game. But when it cuts to a cut scene, it can become a lot more cinematic and that's where you might have more close-ups, etc. Your face is in constant close-up because you've got the camera pointed at it. <laughs> and, um, so it. and of course, the camera can be anywhere. Yeah. 
and they can change it in post too. <laughs> so what you thought was a close up can yeah. become something like a totally wide shot three years later. I'd love to hear the perspective for you as an actor going into a situation like that. What were they telling you? What were they informing you of? Were they saying, you know, broad in your performance, you know, wide in your performance? How did you have to adjust as an actor to that situation? That's a really good question because I didn't often see the work, or, or at least if I did, it was several years after. I mean, some scenes took three years to do, whether it be because of someone's schedule or just the way the schedule was. was. You know, children would have literally been born, and then, <laughs> and then we finished the scene. That's, why, that's where the animators were really so, so helpful. Uh, we really became a valuable team. And in many ways, you know, having worked on this, that project for so long and being obligated to our NDAs and not being able to talk about the work with anyone else except each other, we literally became our own gang, much like you have in the game. And uh, the fact that we weren't able to communicate about it with anyone except each other really gave us a, a very solid mutual understanding of each other's characters, each other's motivations, and the story, you know? And uh, it, 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 the animators were very supportive of the artists, and uh, they understood the needs that we had. Some They understood the context that we asked for. and. Uh, and it was invaluable, yeah. Let's talk about getting the role. And you had just completed the first Red Dead, correct? When you were yeah. going into that edition. So you had a little, w without knowing that yeah, that's without. what you were going in for. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about that experience. Had your previous uh, experience with mocap actually helped you in that audition? And what were, the, what, were the, what were the notes that they gave you as far as what you were coming in with? Our, my agent, Renee Glicker, she knew that I had done a video game before. Uh, so she, she when, it, when it popped up on her desk, she was like, oh yeah, Roger will probably like this. Uh, and she was right. <laughs> uh, so we went in, and I remember it being a cold audition. There was no sides in advance. They wanted to see how we read cold. And it was a scene which they n didn't end up using, but, uh, and it wasn't even in the context of a Western, but they did ask for a Western accent. And I remember it was, it was some guy who was just coming into a bar, and he was just shooting the shooting the chewing the fat with the uh, bartender and uh and then at the end of it uh, i said well sorry but i gotta kill you now someone's put a price on your head so did it forgot about it as you do with every audition you, you gotta put it out of your head and then i was doing theater in florida and renee called me and said oh they want you but you're down in florida so i i, I told them i you, you had to pass and i went oh okay well that's that then uh and then a few months later, they called again. Is, is he still in Florida? No. Okay, well, have him, bring him in. And that was uh, August of 2013. And that was my first day in the, in the mocap studio with Rockstar Games. Yeah. And there was, a sec there was a callback, too, as I recall. That's where I met our, our amazing director, Rod Edge. And he was very concerned with my walk. Because it's 90% of what you look at in the game, that and it's him all riding about a horse. The boots, right? Did yeah. they have you throw they some boots They told me on? to wear, they show up in cowboy boots, yeah. <laughs> That's when I started, that was when my first suspicions came. Like, is this the next Red Dead? Because I know it's Rockstar now, and I had just finished playing Red Dead yeah. to the point, and it was no spoilers, but you know, John Marston, the iconic John Marston, which was wonderfully performed by Rob Weedoff, was just, it blew my mind. It blew my mind tenfold compared to little E.T. trying to find that phone. Uh, and the fact also that he dies in the end. Now, obviously, your video, games character, video game characters die all the time, but no, this is, he actually dies, and then you start playing as someone else. And I remember d when that first happened to me, I thought, I must have done something wrong. I got to go back to the previous save. But no, that's the way it was written, and the, the way that and as we were talking earlier, the way that games has matured with its audience and has come up with more adult themes like that is, uh, I think, is justifying it as this new, amazing medium in which to tell stories. I mean, led in part by Red Dead with the expansiveness of the worlds and that exactly, that interaction with the world. It's so big. Yeah. I, st I am f still finding new things. <laughs> so big. I mean, it... I worked on it for five years. I know other people worked on it for longer than that, especially the designers 
Rockstar Games is, you know, they are leaders of the field. Um, not just with Red Dead, but you know, several other franchises which are amazing to play, like Grand Theft Auto and Max Payne and L.A. Confidential, L.A. Noir. Sorry, I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about those leaders and their writers. And when you were first walking in, did they give you a lot of information to work with as far as you know how to study for your character, how to build the character, or did you take the lead on that? I asked them a lot of questions. Um, I knew. I knew that I couldn't recreate what Rob Weedolf had done with John Marston. That would have been an exercise in futility because what he did was amazing. And I, I remember the whole time, you know, we were working in a literal bubble, you know, so I, the whole time I was working on it, it was something I was a little concerned about was, are people going to hate Arthur Morgan for not being John Marston? So when the game finally came out and people seemed to regard him in the same fold, I was like, Whew, that's Five amazing. years is a long time to wonder that. I hope yeah. you don't put yourself through that the entire time. No, I mean, in the end, I had to realize I, I got to do my own thing. But to go back to answer your question more accurately, I remember asking them at the time. I, was, I started watching loads of Westerns. There was a guy I was working with at the time from Flagstaff, Arizona, who helped me out with the accent, uh, although a bit of Deep South did blend in there, too. <laughs> I, f I felt... Consistency was more important than accuracy because speaking from personal experience, you know, my accent's all over the place. So, and that's because I traveled a lot as a child and Arthur did too. So I thought, why not take in little bits and pieces from, uh, from iconic Western accents and create your own voice. So that's what I did. And they, I asked them for what kind of research would you guys recommend so that, you know, we can kind of get on the same page. And, um, Rod told me that Dan Hauser really enjoyed The Proposition, mm. which uh, kind of isn't a Western because it's set in the Australian outback, but it, it is. It's it is a Western. technically a Western, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then that, you know, Guy Pierce has to come to terms with his, the loyalty that he has for his crazy brother. And in the end, I realized that, you know, that was kind of a, a parallel with Arthur and Dutch, too. So there was that. Uh, that was very helpful. And... Um, you know, the Western genre is one of the most familiar genres for modern day audiences. You know, everybody has a very clear understanding of what it is. So it's hard to, it's hard to cover new ground when, uh, when you have those expectations that you have to meet. Uh, but one of the ways that I tried to do it was to come up with a, a protagonist in a Western that uh, has vulnerabilities and fears and weaknesses, because you don't often see that. You know, it's, it's John Wayne's tough, you know, and he doesn't have feelings, and he'll, he'll beat the crap out of you if you do, sort of thing. But the fact that Arthur, you know, when he, when he comes face to face with his own mortality and the fears that that brings, uh, I wanted to be able to address that, because I don't think uh, a Western had done, really done that before. I mean, Clint Eastwood kind of covered it in Unforgiven, because it, it explores what it's actually like to kill someone, which we had never seen in Westerns before up until the that point either. The emotional toll of that, yes. Yeah. You know, you take away everything he, he ever had or ever will, ha is going to have. And so uh, if we c to come up with a protagonist that was scared to die uh, and was literally making it up as he goes along as to how he dealt with that was something that I was really lucky to ex be able to explore, and it also because of the amazing writing of Dan Hauser, Michael Unsworth, and Rupert Humphreys. You mentioned uh, Dutch and Sadie, and tell me about meeting the rest of your castmates and what that was like. Yeah, well, like I said earlier, you know, we, we really were a gang in the end, because we couldn't talk about, you know, obviously the video game industry is extremely competitive, and Red Dead had already been a, a very, very well-loved franchise before. So obviously, privacy is needed. So we just had each other to talk about it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was I, they're, the, they're my best friends now. You know, I love them dearly. And it was a joy to work with all of them. You know, there really wasn't, you know how they say there's always one? There wasn't on this project. Or maybe it was me. You know? <laughs> That's, they do say that, don't they? If, there's always one. And if you don't know who it is, it's you. So. <laughs> I don't think it was you. Um, do you remember the first scene that you shot? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. It was with Peter Blomquist, who plays Micah Bell, who is one of the, uh, one of the many antagonists that now people 
Love to, you know, he, he gets love called, a, hate, oh yes. my gosh, he gets called a rat all the time. I love it. <laughs> my first scene was with him. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know how well you all know the game, but he has this quote, uh, big shadow, tiny tree. That's what you, and, he, that's what he, uh, and Arthur was like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> so then uh, we go on and yeah, we, we were getting ready to do a robbery. I remember that scene, yeah. That was one of the first ones. And then uh, the, another one we did that day was when Reverend Swanson uh, gets blind drunk during a card game and you have to take out, yeah. I had to lift up that guy. I lifted up a lot of guys. First time, first time I met Rob Weedoff, I was carrying him within an hour. <laughs> And he's about the same size as me. He's a little thinner, but whew, he's not light, I'll tell you. And you don't get credit for that. The character does. Arthur yeah, gets right? credit for that. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah. So when you first showed up, you didn't get sides. You didn't get sides. But tell me about the scripting process. And for that five years, did you know exactly where your character was going, or did they sort of feed it to you? It was fed. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly, but I'm told that the, the main script, which doesn't even take into account all the, the random dialogue from NPCs, etc. But the main script, I think, is around 10,000 pages. They, they said that when you stacked it all up, it was almost as tall as a person. Um, so we crunched that out, and it took us five years. Uh, typically, I would get my sides, our schedule would be three weeks on, two weeks off, and I would get my sides about a week in advance. Um, I didn't know that Arthur was going to die until I did the scene with Thomas Downs. And there was a very specific direction there saying, Thomas Downs coughs in Arthur's face. And I was like, well, why, why, what, what's the, oh, okay. <laughs> I started Googling when they found a cure for tuberculosis. Uh, so yeah, but if ever I had a question, I, I knew, it, I always knew it was going to be answered. But uh, no, the, 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 the story was fed to us. And I, I think that there was a very skeletal structure of the story. I think they kind of had a vague idea of where it was going to go, but you know, the, the actors that they cast and the way that the story and narrative just organically unfolded, I know that definitely did affect the writing too. Uh, some things were changed, you know, some others were cut. I remember at the beginning, Arthur had a son that dies. So a lot of my stuff, I had this very inner quiet rage that once the, the dead son was cut, didn't make as much sense. So we, we, we changed it, you know? But uh, they, they were smart. They didn't commit themselves to anything. They, they let it unfold organically. And they saw how you guys fit into your roles. And I think it mostly, yeah. you know, people try to make these comparisons. I think these, these games are almost like, you know, seasons of Westworld. You know, it's a, the epicness, the whole, the scale, yeah. the storylines, yeah. and the way that you guys are fed the information. And did you guys, when, when the cast was getting together, did you, you know, call each other or text each other? Do you see what we're doing or do you see what we're shooting? All the yeah, time. absolutely. Yeah, because we literally had no one else to talk to about it. <laughs> what were you telling people at this time? Were you like, I'm in the CIA? Were yeah. You like, were you like, you're trying to, when you're trying to keep an NDA? My wife knew, but, uh, I shouldn't even say that, but I, my <laughs> wife knew. I was just telling people I'm working on a video game, and it got to the point where like three, four, five years in, I think people were starting to think I was bullshitting them. It's like, you still working on that video game, Raj? You know, it's okay if you can't find work as an actor. We still like you, you're still our friend. You don't need to... And then, and then the billboard started showing up, and I don't think, you know, a lot of people didn't realize until like the, the voice, even the voice though, some people still don't, to this day, still don't know that's me. So. That's crazy. I think also the scale of these things and the way that they capture some of the production. I mean, you have horses in here, you have dogs that are wearing the suits, am I correct? And you're actually yeah. motion capturing dogs. And yeah, yeah. Tell me about the scale of this that might pe you know, surprise people out there. I never worked with the horses, uh, but I do remember working with dogs and I remember it was a problem because the, they need to ball, they need, the, the ball kept falling off on his tail because he was wagging it so much. And they had to really get, like, I, I don't know how they did it in the end, but there was this dog running around in mocap suits. It was hilarious. And it was, you know, tra those, those dogs were awesome. They were trained so well, trained a lot better than me. I'm sure my wife would agree. But uh, they were, 
They were really fun to work with, yeah. Mm. I mean, what were you doing there as, in, as part of your process as an actor? When you're in those situations and you're, you're filming a movie, the production design is full out, you have houses, you have dogs, you have horses, they're all there. What were you thinking? Were you able to go into your imagination and see these things? How did you sort of lay the land when you're walking around bars and, and posts rather than a house? Again, that's where the animators were invaluable. You know, so whenever I'd get my sides and we'd, we'd go, go at it, I, the animators would show me the environment that we were actually in, and that would really help. Uh, we'd be able to remem remind ourselves if it was cold to act accordingly, you know, if we're in the swampy Saint Denis outskirts, we have to remember to swat flies, etc. You, you really start to pick up on it, and you realize that it's the little details that, uh, that really bring an, a, a performance to its audience. So um, having to remember th little things like that, like in, in that scene, for example, I remember wipe, wiping your hands after you helped Jimmy Brooks up off the cliff. But uh, you know, we, we were working in a very clean environment where that wasn't necessary, but I had to remind myself, you know, this is a cliff face now, so your hands are gonna be dirty. All those little details, which the animators were always on top of, and <clears throat> you know, I love theater because when you work on theater, there's no filter between you and your audience. But with film, there's many filters. There's the filter of the editor, the, the cameraman, the director. But in gaming, there's also the filter of the animator because they can literally change your performance if they want to, you know? Um, so that made me a little apprehensive when I started working with them. But as the years went by and we began to understand each other's jobs more, uh, it really became a vital partnership where you know we trusted each other completely and uh, and we did what we had to do to, to make it easier for each other so that's where the, you know the the th stuff that they brought to the table and the fact that they always went out of their way to answer any of my questions uh, you know is, is, is often why I share you know a lot of Arthur's success with them you know I mean, you mentioned the kind of work that goes into there after. When was the first time that you got to see Arthur in a completed scene? Oh, in a completed scene? I guess that would have been in the VO booth maybe a few years in. Um, yeah. So two years before you're seeing any completed scene of your work? They would show me something for reference if, it was, if, if we were doing VO that continued from something that we had previously done. That was the first time I, and I, I was in the booth, and so I would be able to put myself in the place where that scene needed me to be. So that was the first, I think it was about two or three years in when I actually started to see completed footage. But at the, on the very first day, they have what they call previs, which is, I think stands for pre-visualization. I'm not going to pretend to know the technical it details. It does, you got it. it. <laughs> but uh, I would see a very basic render of Arthur, and I, I saw that blue shirt on like the second or, th or a third time I was in the studio, and that also, obviously, you know, Many actors will tell you that they don't really, sometimes they don't really discover the true essence of the character until they're finally in their costume. And I remember lo seeing him for the first time up on the screen, and it was a bit more of a pixelated version of Arthur than we just saw earlier. But that, that really, that was almost like the last jigsaw piece coming into place. And once that five years passed and it was out there, you know, what did you think about the reception and how did that feel? Oh. Well, like I said earlier, all I was going for was them not to hate, for people not to hate him for not being John Marston. But the fact now that he's regarded, as, you know, kind of around this, on the same level as John Marston is beyond my widest hopes. Uh, the community since the games come out has been insane. You know, I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of them at comic conventions and whatnot, and so many people have told me that, you know, kids 12 years old and whatnot their grandfather will be walking by and she says, oh, and then they'll, they'll do a double take because they see their son actually playing a Western. And, <laughs> and it's, it's bridged generations, you know? Uh, it, so many times I, it brought me and my grandfather closer together before he passed away. These amazing stories that I'm, pr I mean, the joy of any, the joy is in the doing, you know? Uh, any actor with their salt will tell you that it, it's, it's the work that matters. But for your work to be appreciated uh, by so many is just gravy. It's icing on the cake. Uh, I feel very, very lucky. 
there's a lot of uh, motion capture artists that don't and actors who don't have you know, uh, enough in common, maybe with Planet of the Apes and that sort of thing. They don't look anything like that, but yeah. you actually they got more look common a little bit you like, you look like, you look like Arthur. You, your There's voice is there, so do people yeah. recognize you at this point? I don't get recognized. For they recognize the voice at all? Not really. No, it has happened once or twice. She just, yeah, yeah. your wife just negated what you just said there. Well, <laughs> true. I was in a diner once and some girl came up to me and she said, are you Roger Clark? And my five-year-old goes, yeah, and I'm Rory Clark, and that's Colin Clark. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, so anonymity is a cool thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a resemblance between me and Arthur, but uh, the fact that he doesn't look exactly like me does lend a certain objectivity. So I, I usually cringe when I see myself on film or, on, or hear myself in audio. But for some reason, Arthur, the, you know, there's a, a, enough of a disconnect where I can just critique the performances, you know, and just enjoy the story. Do you have any favorite lines that people say to you? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> people ask me to cough. Uh, <laughs> they ask me if I'm all right, boy. They ask me if I've got any money for them. Um, yeah. They ask me if I'm going to Tahiti. <laughs> yeah, lot. It's a lot of that. There's a lot of it. What do you think about you know the current state of Hollywood with you know the success of Witcher and that sort of thing? These yeah. these these worlds are overlapping. That's so right. And I just read today that uh, Eli Roth is going to be doing Borderlands. That sounds really exciting, because up until now, you know, video games haven't really successfully transferred well to cinema. But Sonic kind of changed that, and we got Uncharted coming. So the, the whole definition of celebrity is changing, you know, and you go in a, for a film, you go to the film because you're like, oh, I love that actor. I'd like to see what they're doing in that. That's not the same reason you would necessarily buy a video game. It's not because, I mean, if Troy Baker's in it, that's great, you know, but it's not really the, the priority of, the ch of what really informs your choice. It's the gameplay, it's the stories, it's the graphics. So... It's the whole concept of performance is changing, I think, in the 21st century. You know, there's the star system is starting to fade away now. And, you know, and with the Marvel Universe, too, you know, we, we're going to see the character of Thor live on, whether or not Chris Hemsworth is doing it or not. And I, and I think that's indicative of the way that the industry is going forward. And that, you know, that has that bears its own challenges. But uh, I think it's a good thing. You know, I think it it'll level the playing field because, you know, and also it has the, the potential of performance capture to do that too and to, to have rep equal representation in our industry, which we do need a lot more of now. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on it, but I think we, we, we can always strive to do more and I think performance capture is a great medium to help that because if you're casting for Napoleon Bonaparte, you don't need to just get short white guys. You know, you, you can really choose, and you know, you could see a much larger pool Best of actor actors. For the moment, absolutely. absolutely yeah. How do you think uh, Red Dead would, would fare as a movie? Oh, gosh. Well, two hours isn't enough. <laughs> no, no, Maybe I, a franchise. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? You know, I, I personally think it's a great video game. You know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Would you want to be a part of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. I, it's weird, you know, because an actor, obviously you, f you can't help but feel a little ownership for your work, but, you know, you've got to learn to let it go as soon as you're done. And especially in gaming, too, because you have even less ownership, because the, the player, at least in, if you're the playable character, because the player is you. In many ways, they have more ownership over the character than you do, because they're the ones responsible for their behavior. So... You've got to come up with a performance that's ambiguous enough to reflect that. Um, obviously, Arthur is a definite character and he has traits and whatnot, but especially in the latter half of the, of the narrative, there were many things that, many aspects of the story that would be different depending on the player's behavior, whether they had high honor or low honor and whatnot. So I had to come up with an ambiguous enough performance that would work either way whether he's a total bastard or a really nice guy, and to come up with and to deliver a line in a way that would make sense for both was, uh, was an interesting challenge. 
You mentioned the games that you were playing while you were doing the acting. You mentioned games that you've been playing after and since. You know, tell me about, have you found yourself appreciating some of those performances now that you've been through this situation, and what performances have you really loved? Absolutely, oh yeah. I mean, I had, when I graduated college, I, I kind of stopped playing video games because I just didn't have the time anymore. And then shortly before I started working on Red Dead, I, st I just, for some reason, I bought an Xbox 360 and I started again, and I... It, I was blown away by how much it had changed, and I got Skyrim and Red Dead Redemption. Those were the first two games that I, that was when I revisited, and I was blown away. Troy Baker is amazing, um, so is Nolan North. I mean, there are some really skilled veterans who have, who have molded the landscape of performance in games, you know? So it's a truly remarkable thing to behold. And the fact that so many of these actors are, um, you know, aren't, going back to what we were saying earlier, celebrities, it really gives the audience an unfiltered view of the story, you know? I, know, I remember reading once Dan Hauser's, you know, his, having Ray Liotta as the lead in Vice City was kind of jarring in a ways because every once in a while you just go, oh, it's the guy from Goodfellas, you know? And I know the Hausers wanted to avoid that. They wanted to immerse the player as much as humanly possible and not, and not and the fact that you know I was a relative unknown off-Broadway actor kind of helps assist that, you know? Yeah. A relatively unknown uh, Broadway actor with a BAFTA nomination now, so how'd that feel? Oh, you know, again, the joy is in the doing, mm -hmm. but when your work's appreciated, uh, especially by something as reputable as BAFTA, you know, having trained in Britain and started my career there, this really means a lot. You know, I, I have a lot of regard for the BAFTAs. Uh, and we, you know, we were saying earlier, the BAFTAs were one of the first organizations to acknowledge gaming, too. I think the BAFTA games started, like, 2002 or something. I remember when I first played Max Payne, and it said BAFTA nominee on it. And I was like, BAFTA? Do th oh, my gosh. <laughs> for them to have acknowledged this brand new medium that early, I thought, was awesome. And now you've gotten this uh, reputation, you have this experience, you want to continue with this kind of work? Do you find yourself wanting uh, other pursuits? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, there's so much, there's so much more potential for performance capture. In just the, the limited years that I've seen, I know that there's just going to be more and more. So uh, I would be very excited to be a part of that. Yeah. And I think I've got, you know, I feel comfortable in Lycra now. That seems like a great way to end the conversation. Thanks so much for coming out, guys. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Roger Clark. Thank you.